All right, if we just get those doors closed, because I think they're going to start, they're going to start Sunday school any moment. And amen, we'll start our Bible hour here this morning. Praise God. Glad you're all here this morning, bright and early. Amen. Uh, before we get started, why don't we open up in prayer? Uh, Jared, would you mind opening us up in prayer, please? All right, excellent. So we're going to continue our study on uh, if Jesus came to church and we're looking at the seven churches of the book of Revelation and uh, really it's a timeless guidance for the church at large and our church as well. And really what we're kind of asking ourselves throughout this series is if Jesus came to our church, what letter would he write about us? What would he have to say about us? And we've spoken about Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum, or Pergamus, uh, the last couple of weeks. Does anyone remember anything from those, anything that stood out to you about some of those churches? Some of you are smiling and laughing now because you don't remember anything, but that's okay. <laughs> but anything that stood out, anything that you remembered from them. Ephesus was the, I'll give you some, some stuff here. Ephesus was the loveless church. Smyrna was the persecuted church and Pergamus or Pergamon was the uh, compromising church. So anyone remember some things? Jeanette? Should be on. Hello. There you go. Okay. Um uh, play, be happy, etc. in church and things like that. Enjoy life. Woo. Yes. Very good. What else from our study? Amen. <laughs> Pop quiz. <laughs> Sorry. I've read a lot of um, and listened to different um, theologians about the, this part of Revelations and it, it it reflects humanity in every church and, and its downfalls, its pitfalls that we can fall into. Yeah. So, um, you know, the the loveless and then the, you know, the the um, the church that, that allows itself to be manipulated, controlled, and, and, and eventually it's, it's corrupted. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, very good. Look, I'll stop the pop quiz, all right, because, amen. Oh, oh we've got Matt. Matt, um, grab... The microphone, Matt, Matt has a comment as well. I just about um, Pergamos, the compromising church, so theirs was um, related to being led to just look, and then yes. that opened the door to all sorts of debauchery and compromise. Um, yes. And so, you know, our example, uh, how we how we live. Um, affects others and that we need to, yeah, we need to model a way to live that helps other people. Very good. Yep. So that was um, the the compromising church. Very good. And so, uh, amen. That's the kind of answer I'm looking for. Hallelujah, because you've been paying attention. Hallelujah. So, amen. Hopefully you can remember. Anyone remember the very first church? No? All right. I said I'll, I'll stop the pit pop quiz because I'm scaring you all. Sunday morning, everyone's frightened. No one likes a pop quiz on a Sunday morning, all right? So I'll give you a break this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But what we're going to look at today is the church at Thyatira. And so it's, it's title in your in your book, in your Bible is likely uh, perhaps the corrupt church maybe or something along those lines. We're going to read Revelation chapter 2, 18 to 29. We'll read that in just a few moments, but I'm going to give a couple of other scriptures out before we will read that. So uh, uh, put your hand up if you can read Acts 16, 13 to 15. Melanie, thank you. And then 1 Kings 16, verse 31. Rachel, thank you very much. 1 Kings 21, 25 to 26. Raymond, thank you. All right. Uh, what have we got here? 
1 Timothy 2, 12 to 15. Who could read that? Thank you, Garrett. And... All right, and then Genesis 3, verse 16 through to 19. Who could read that? Genesis chapter 3. Matthew, thank you. Okay, I think that's going to be it. Then there'll be maybe some verses that we'll need to read here. Okay, so what we're doing again this morning, Bible Hour, this is for us uh, to uh, make comment and talk talk amongst each other as well. We're studying this, and we're going to look at the book, the, uh, we're looking at the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2, verse 18 through to 29. We're going to talk about the church at Thyatira. So again, Jesus is writing letters to each of these churches, and each of these churches he's got maybe a commendation, but then he's also got some issues and some problems. And so he's addressing some of the issues that are found in these churches. And again, today, it can still be applied to ourselves. We can ask ourselves, what church would we maybe be? How, what would Jesus say about us? And we're learning from each of these churches. So we're going to talk about Thyatira. We're going to talk a, few, a little bit about the historical background and spiritual history. Historically, it's built in the third century BC before Christ. It was named after the daughter of one of Alexander the Great's advisors. Her name was Tyre, and uh, Tyra was the word for city, and so it's literally Tyre's city, right? Thyatira, and so today it's still a city. It's called Akasar. It's about 50,000 people, so it's like a bit of a, a smaller kind of town feel, but it still is there today. Uh, they've built over the ruins, and there's just not much interest in up-earthing any of the ruins there, and so they don't mind doing that. Some spiritual history, so the gods of this church, uh, some of the minor gods were one called Asclepion, which was uh, a, uh, an image of a snake, and uh, it had to do with healing and uh, 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 pharmacia, uh, pharmacy stuff, healing, these sorts of things, um, and then Dionysus, which was about drunkenness, and Diana, which was the mother of God that they worshipped. These were the gods primarily that they worshipped. But uh, the number one that they worshipped was Tyrimnus, which was uh, their version of Zeus, basically. And so um, it's just interesting. This god actually symbolized by, is symbolized by a strong man wielding an axe. Why is that interesting? I'll tell you in a moment. But uh, the reason why it's interesting is because this city was intricately um, connected with the trade unions. And this god was connected with their trades and the unions in the city. So this city wasn't an intellectual city. They weren't uh, like some of the other cities that we've studied. They weren't into all their reading and that, but it was actually a center of industry. And so it had lots of trades and workmen. Basically, it was blue collar people in this city. Um, they fashioned bronze, brass helmets for Romans, uh, leather. Uh, they had bakers, wool, cloth, po uh, potters, all sorts like this. They were especially known, though, for their industry in producing purple cloth, which was a sign of uh, royalty and advancement. But all these trades, it's interesting, every one of them had unions that people were required to be a part of. So you had to be. If you were going to be a tradesman in this city, you actually had to be a part of the union. Now, if anyone's ever been on any work sites, especially here in Australia, uh, you don't always have to be a part of the union. But I remember going and we were working on uh, one of the larger uh, uh, hospitals. I'm a plumber by trade. We were working on one of the larger hospitals south of the river. I've forgotten what the name of it is now, in down in Perth. Uh, it was a newer one that we were working on. Um, but they would have days where our boss, because we, our, our, our crew, we were not a part of the union. And there were days where they would say, listen, don't come in until nine. And it's like, okay. The reason why is because they said, listen, the, all, the union guys are going to be standing at all the gates to the, to the construction site and they're going to be p asking every single person, show us your union ticket, show us your And if you don't, they're going to absolutely harass you until you sign up. And they'll call you a scab and they, they will harass you saying that you're getting all these benefits and everyone else is paying, you're not paying, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, and so very similar like that. They would have just been, I suppose, groups going around and if, if you're not a part of the unions that they have for every one of these trades, 
then you weren't allowed to be a tradesman. You weren't allowed to be involved like that. So this city was really about that. Um, that obviously heavily affected and influenced the economy of this city and also the religion. Because it's interesting, when the tradesmen were paid off, how many you know what happens when tradesmen get paid off? <laughs> right? It's party time. I remember again, tradesmen, I think uh, for us it was like a Thursday, payday comes and the boys would be off down to the pub or they'd come back with cartons and we'd be getting wasted after, right after work and uh, very foolish and crazy. But that's what tradesmen do. Well, the tradesmen of this time did a very similar thing, but even took it to another level. And uh, they would go off to the temple of Tyrimnus to go and worship and they'd give their offerings maybe, their sacrifices. They would get drunk. They'd eat the meat that's offered to idols, but primarily they would go and have sex with the temple prostitutes. And so they were getting involved in this worship. This was a form of worship that they would do. And so a lot of the tradesmen were involved in this. This city was very involved in that. Uh, again, the tradesmen, many of them are all trade tradesmen, uh, not so educated, but very involved in this. It seems that one of the pressures that the early Christians had to face was this, which was to be a part of this. We did touch base a little bit on this on the previous church we talked about, about pressure to be involved in uh, pagan worship, in these sorts of things and tempted to fall like that. And the truth is, is that every society and every culture will have issues that believers are going to have to wrestle with. Every culture is going to have pressures that can be placed upon Christian men and women to try to try to pressure you to compromise, to pressure you to participate or be involved in these worldly things. What might some of those be? Maybe let's talk about let's talk about our city. Let's talk about Drilton and the Australian culture. What might be some of the pressures that can be placed on us that are more worldly than Christ-like? What might some of those be? We'll open it up. Matt. Working on Sunday, right? So what's the root of that? Where's that come from though? Like what are they, why would they work on the Sunday? Yes. Yes, right, gaining wealth, money. So money can be a god, can't it, right? And we can worship money. And so rather than coming to worship God on a Sunday or having a day of rest like that, that God has, that God has uh, made for us, people who worship money, they go, well, hold on a minute. Sunday, I get all the penalty rates. Here in Australia, we get lots of penalty rates. In America, they don't get the same penalty rates that you guys get. But over, over here, we get all these penalty rates. And so it can be very tempting. Amen. I, I was, I, amen. I've been a tradesman and I've been there. And the boss has said, listen, on Sunday, you're going to get two and a half times pay. <whistles> really? You mean I can make almost half my pay in one day? Tempting, isn't it, right? So there can be pressures uh, that, that are put upon us to maybe uh, give up surrendering to God and saying, God, I'm going to give up that, that money that I might be able to make because I want to come and worship you. I want to put you first in my life. I want you to be first for me and my family, et cetera. And we can say, I, we can say, I don't want that, but we can be pressured to not do that. We can be very good. That's a good one. Artie, were you going to say something? Ah, he said he's going to work today. <laughs> oh, that's right, Adi. I love your honesty, brother. You're all right, brother. You got to do what you got to do. Amen. But uh, amen. As long as you put God first. But hey, you're working today, but you're here this morning, aren't you? All right. So you're here this morning. You haven't gone. Ah, blow it. I'm working. Blow it. I'm going. I'm just going to go to work and not go to church at all. Right. You could have said that. Right. So don't be condemned. Who else? What are some other things that can pressure us? Are we, do we have the live stream going on? So we need to, let's use the microphone because 
I've had people ask and, and say we, we want to hear what people are saying. Today's society has got a – it's almost a game to try to, to, to um, pull down those who have, have found Jesus. They want to um, try and pull you back into sin all the time through alcohol and, um, you know, just, you know, those sort of um, – so is that a culture in Australia? It definitely is a culture. Yeah, yeah. They see they see you as a challenge. Drinking culture. Yeah, see you as a challenge. Try and drink. Oh, come. Oh man, you, you got to come back. Yep. No, come back to what? You know, yep. I got away from that for a reason. Yeah. You know that, and and that's, you know, and you get that all the time. It's like, yeah. So that's where yeah, you, especially in that's the, the devil coming straight at you. Especially in you know, men. Uh, I, I'm not sure about ladies because I'm not a woman, so I don't know. I've never never been a woman. Never will be a woman. Never worked like a woman, but I have been a man and I've, <laughs> I've worked at trades and I could probably say every single one of them will push you to drink. Oh, come on, mate, have a few, right? How's about the, and I suppose this might include women as well, the work, the workplace party. Come on, just come to the workplace party. Just come. And then when you're there, just have a couple, one or two. Come on. What are you? Stop being such a boring old person. Just just live a little, enjoy a little, and they'll push you to do that, right? So there can be pressures because it is a culture. I was um, I uh, I found it uh, quite humorous to find that apparently they're going to open up another pub down the road there, and it's like hey, we need we we need another pub. <laughs> Someone told me there was like eight pubs down that street. Marine Terrace on eight pubs. Wow, eight places to go get a beer. Why do we need so many places to get a beer? Right? It's a small country town with forty thousand people. We, we got to eat. We need. You know what we don't? You know what we don't have? Is another pub. We need another pub. Need, hey man, this is Australian culture. We love to just have the beers. Hey Amen, and the cheers, and et cetera, et cetera, and all those things. Right? So very good. That's another culture. What's some other things in Australian culture? Were those hands, or did you, did you retract that hand? <laughs> All right, Mel, and then and then um, Jeanette and Jared. I work at a school, and mm. we have PDs, and um, some of the things we do in PD is health and well-being, and so they really promote uh, new age meditation, yoga, and so it's part of the you know PD and stuff. But I usually mm. just pretend I'm closing my eyes and don't do anything. But that's what they're, they're looking for an answer. They think that, you know, for your mental health, you know, you need to relax and breathe and, and so forth. And they find that very acceptable. Mm -hmm. Very true. And I think that, that in, in our day and age and in the culture, that is very true. And, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Things just kind of go around in circles. And today, a lot of culture is, you know, they, they understand that there's a need. They understand that there's brokenness. They understand that there's uh, depression and anxiety and all these things. And so they're getting very involved in um, certain particular breathing techniques, um, you know, these, these yoga programs. Uh, there's these men's yoga programs where you come and they'll make you, they'll do all these things to you. They'll make you break down and weep and turn into a snoveling baby on the floor. And honestly, there's all these things, right? But it's a culture that is being... Um, pushed in, in and around the world. But even um, it's what you're mentioning, it, Mel, is very true, even being pushed into the churches where it's very new agey. And, uh, you know, we're going to... Uh, uh, have you ever heard of soaking, which is a reasonably newer um, in the last few years, maybe the last decade or so, soaking, where what they'll do is they, they, they play worship music, but it's just instrumental and everyone lies on the floor at the altar and um, you just lie on the floor for an hour or two or something like that, and you just apparently soak in that, right? Anyways, it's just very new agey and strange, and and it become it gets weirder and weirder, right? So very true. So that can be a culture that can be pushed on us. We can be pressured to feel that we need to go down some of those routes. Um, and then Jeanette. And then we'll... Playing or watching sport? Nowadays. Hey, there you go. Yay. There's one, isn't it, Je Jeanette? Hey, playing or watching sport? We, we can be very into our sports, can't, can't we? Right? And look, I, I, I enjoy uh, following some sport. In the last year and a half, I haven't enjoyed watching um, AFL because 
anyways, the name that shall be unnamed, the team that shall be left unnamed. We won't bother saying who I support, but that's not been so enjoyable. But I enjoy it, and I enjoy some watching some sport, but it's very true, isn't it, Jeanette? We can get caught up in that, and that can become everything. I remember as a young man, you know, uh, being in AFL Auskick, and uh, it was always on Saturday mornings, but then when they, when you got older, it began to be on Sunday mornings. And, um, and so there was pressure to, well, I want my kids to be involved, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was pressure to, again, um, leave church service and go take the kids to um, uh, uh, I was kicking all those things. So very good. That's a, that's a sport that can be one. And then Jared? Sport and entertainment, same thing. And then Matt? Um, just the whole godlessness in science and, 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 and evolution. Mm. So if you put your hand up and say that you don't believe in that, you believe in creation, set six days, you know, the earth is six or 7,000 years old, you know, you, you really feel a pushback on that. Like mm. you're not intelligent if you think that. Mm -hmm. And then from there, so science and godlessness and then, now you see that manifesting in the whole gender fluidity thing that you weren't created that way. That yes. you know, you you you've got a mix up between your spirit and your and your and your physical body, you know, that God didn't do any of that. You're just a bunch of cells and genes, and so you can just make up whatever whatever sex that you feel like. Or gender, sorry, not gender, they don't yeah. believe in sex. No, very true, very true. So these are all very good. Very, very good. So there's a lot of pressures. Um, all around us in the world as Christians to want us to conform to that. Um, and every society, every culture is going to have that that we're going to have to wrestle with. It's interesting, in 150 AD, there was a Christian sect and heresy uh, called Montanism. Montanism. It was uh, what they did is they put undue emphasis on spiritual experience and they de-emphasized the role of the mind being involved. And so they believe that you had to receive an obvious sign or inspiration from God. Otherwise, you were not going to be saved or you're not saved. They mixed the gospel with some old beliefs concerning idols. They taught that marriage should be banned. Uh, they turned fasting into a law. They had tax collectors to collect offerings. They hired people to spread these views. Uh, they also had some adherent abher view on the Holy Spirit, which was an undue emphasis on gifts which followers believe they could distribute to other people. And so I could come and I could say, I'm going to give you this gift. I'm going to give you that gift, etc. And so that was a big push involving this church and this city uh, was this sect and heresy. And nothing again is new, right? There's the whole charismatic movement where there's an undue emphasis on the Holy Ghost an undue emphasis on that. Anyone remember Brownsville and the Pensacola uh, laughing revivals where people are falling on the floor, uh, you know, and they're, they're cockroaching. And uh, I remember looking it up and doing my own study on it and seeing people give testimony and that they're falling apart like this and everyone was glor glorify God, praise God. It's like that person's losing it. They're insane. They need help. And we're glorifying God. They're, they're in trouble, man. So they put undue emphasis on the experiential and the feelings and the emotions of everything. And so, listen, in anything, we always got to be careful when people overemphasize one part of Christianity, right? You've got to have good balance. If you overemphasize all on the spirit and feeling and emotion, you're going to be in trouble. Overemphasize on all of the law and just being disciplined, etc., you're going to be in trouble, right? So there's got to be a good balance there. Um, you know, there can be even apocalyptic cults that call themselves Christian, that we're all going to sell everything. We're going to go live on a commune and wear robes and we have our fearless, amazing leader and then we're all going to go drink the Kool-Aid because the aliens are going to come take us out of our beds. We have to wear Nike shoes and wear the right clothes and, and we're all going to kill ourselves and commit suicide. And people follow these things. It's insanity, right? The answer is always the same. People need to balance and measure, and, and measure everything by the word of God. So it's not sure when this church started, but this church was first mentioned in the book of Acts, Acts 16, 13 to 15. On the Sabbath, 
we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some woman who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptised and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. Okay, yeah, that's it. Very good. So it says, um, from the city of Thyatira. So this is the only mention in scripture of this city. This woman is from there. She's a seller of purple. So she was probably a Gentile convert from Judaism and she got saved. So this is the only mention in scripture of this church apart from the book of Revelation. Now, we're going to read this uh, scripture and we're going to look at the spiritual advice that Jesus gives, the letter that he gives to this church. So Revelation 2, 18 to 29, I'll read it out if we can put it up on the screen for me. It says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who, call, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent for her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So verse 18 to the angel of fire, to I write these things that he uh, who has the who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So it's possible there's a reference here to Tyrimnus. Again, this God who has this axe and is working. Uh, feet like burnished brass is a reference perhaps to tradesmen. So again, he's addressing this church specifically. In verse 19, he commends them for their works, their love, their patience. They've, they've been working, they've had they have some good works. But in verse 20, he mentions his major beef with the church. And he says, you, ha you, you allow that woman Jezebel to teach. You allow her to teach. You allow her to, uh, to do this and be involved in sexual immorality. So whether or not this was actually a real person in the church whose name was Jezebel or just a proverbial name from the Old Testament, uh, Jesus is using that name for a reason. Why Jezebel? What does that name represent? And I think that the comparison would be obvious. We find Jezebel's name in 1 Kings chapter 16 through to 20. She dominates the scene. So 1 Kings 16 verse 31. Rachel? Is that Rachel? Is that right? Yeah. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king to the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So he takes uh, Jezebel here. So Ahab is his name. He marries badly. 
You know, the New Testament wisely tells us, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. It's talking about don't marry someone who doesn't believe what you believe, specifically around Christ and, uh, and Jesus. Because if you marry someone who believes the opposite to what you believe, you're going to have a lot of struggles. And uh, amen. Pastor Nigel Brown made a comment saying, you marry an influence. Whoever you marry, they are going to influence you, whether for good or for bad. They're either going to manipulate you or they're going to help you and encourage you and inspire you. They're, they're going to try to control you or they're going to whatever it is, right? And so you marry an influence. And so here Ahab marries Jezebel uh, and he goes and he serves Baal. He worships Baal. Uh, someone said a quote, if you marry a child of the devil, you're likely going to have problems with the father-in-law. <laughs> right? I might add you need to look well to their spiritual condition. Whoever you marry, you need to look well to their spiritual condition. How are they spiritually, right? Do they love what you are a part of, part of? Do they share your same convictions? You need to be wise about that. Otherwise, you're gonna, you are going to struggle if, if you marry unequally like that. But Jezebel, so it's mentioning Jezebel, this woman Jezebel. And again, through chapters 16 to 21, she dominates the scene here. What are some of her sins? Firstly, she threatened Elijah's life when, she, when he slew the prophets of Baal. So Elijah takes dominion for Israel. He's the only prophet of God. All the other prophets are serving Baal and the Ash and uh, uh, all of these other things. And so he stands up, rebukes them, gets a great victory over them, and they slaughter all these prophets of Baal. And so then she threatens and sends a letter saying, basically, I'm going to kill you. I'm coming after you. So she's the queen. She's the, the king's wife. And so she has some form of power, perhaps. And so this worries him. And we know the story runs off and does what he does. But she threatened Elijah to kill the prophet, to kill the pastor, basically. I'm going to take out the man of God. She engineered the murder of Naboth for his vineyard. So if you remember, Ahab says he wants a particular vineyard. He likes that vineyard. Maybe it has just the right grapes that he enjoys or the land is just as nice as he likes, etc. And so he comes home. And he's, it says that he comes home sullen and displeased. He's had a bad day at work. He's upset. Doesn't, didn't get what he wanted to get. So he comes back home and he pouts. And this would be a warning to every man. Don't go home and pout to your wife. Oh, do you know what they said to me? Do you know what they did to me? Because you, know you created Jezebel. She mightn't be a Jezebel, but you could create it. Because she wants to go in and fight for you. She loves you. You go and you pout to her about and you whinge to her about people in church and others. You're going to mess her up. You're going to mess her up, mate. She's not there to, to hold the emotional turmoils that you go through. That's not what your wife is there for. You are there to support her in the emotions and the things that she goes through. You don't go home and pout to her. Otherwise, this can happen. What she ended up doing, she gets fired up. He's sullen and displeased. He won't eat. He goes to bed. I don't want to eat any food. Mm -hmm. Starts sucking his thumb. She goes, right, I'll go do something about it. And so she en engineers the murder of this good man who wouldn't sell his vineyard so that then he, her husband could go and take it. So she's uh, done that. And But mostly her sin is that she stirred up Israel to be involved in sexually immoral worship of Baal, to be involved in immorality, to be involved in these idols, uh, 1 Kings 21, verse 25 to 26. Wasn't that Rachel? See, I thought, I thought I was right. Ashes, come on, guys. How am I remembering this? All right, 1 Kings 21, 25, 26 says, But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children 
of Israel. So Jezebel stirred his, uh, 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 Israel and Ahab to be involved in this. And so Jezebel, this name Jezebel, became the proverbial name for an unsubmitted woman who dominates her husband and uh, male leadership. And so that became the name Jezebel. So in our uh, churches, in most churches, uh, be very careful. Don't go around saying, oh, you're acting like a Jezebel because you're going <laughs> to either get slapped or you'll be in big trouble. Right, So you'd be wise before just going and throwing that out there. But nonetheless, this name became that. So I don't think I'd ever name my daughter Jezebel. But anyway, each their own, I suppose. In verse 20, it says, you allow this woman Jezebel. And so there's some manuscripts and translations that actually render this, you allow your wife Jezebel. So it's possible that maybe just like Ahab, who had surrendered his leadership to a corrupt wife, that his part, this pastor of this church had abdicated his leadership to the pastor's wife, perhaps. Very likely that may be the case in this church, where this man is no longer leading, the wife is leading, but she's also taking him down this path. So we don't have too long, so we're probably going to continue this next week. But this is a hotly debated issue today. Hotly debated issue today. And uh, which is uh, ladies and women in the church, should they or should they not be in leadership? Should they have leadership roles, perhaps? Should they be, should we have the pastor and the pastor's wife, not just a wife, but Amen. She's also a pastor and she preaches and teaches and etc. And so this is hotly debated in our day and age. You know, it wasn't that long ago where this wasn't really much of a debate. It was it was solid. Why? Because scripture is very it's very straight up about this. And so the question is, is, is it OK for women to be pastors, to be shepherds? to pastor churches and have that form of leadership. So what do we need to do? Should we go, well, what does culture tell us? Should we look at the world and go, well, the world's kind of going this way. And, uh, you know, the patriarchy has just been horrible and terrible to women. And we've just, you know, all men are just pigs and they're terrible and evil. And so we need more women in leadership. And that's the way the world's going. So Maybe the church should try to accommodate this a little bit. Is anyone with me? Right, you understand what I'm saying here? This is a good question for us to address and understand. This is what's happening in this church here. He says, you allow that woman Jezebel to teach. Okay, so the answer is this. What does the Bible say? That's probably, that's probably a good answer, isn't it? Well, never mind what culture says. Never mind what... Australia says, never mind what anyone else is saying in the world, I do not care. With all due respect, I care what the Bible says when it comes to pastors and who should pastor a church and be in leadership. So 1 Timothy 2, 12 to 15. Do we know who had that? All right, there we go. Thank you, Garrett. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Uh, verse 14 and 15. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with self-control. Okay, very good. So it's pretty clear what the Bible says. And there's a couple other scriptures, but it's fairly clear. We'll open up in just one sec, Matt. So he says there, um, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now, what is he saying there? Is he saying that in church, when any woman comes to church, she has to zip it? Up, oh, don't you say a word, honey. Don't you say a word. There are men here. You better shut up. Is that what he's saying? It sounds like it, doesn't it? Sounds like it says, I want you to be in silence. But that's why if you read all of the scripture and you understand, 
is he's not saying women can't come to church and talk. And they just have to be in absolute silence and submission. That's not what he's saying. You've got to understand context. With any scripture that you read, context is the key. Because even the devil, Satan himself, was able to take scripture and take it out of context to try to say, well, Jesus, doesn't it say this? Right? But Jesus brings context to everything that the devil tries to say, right? So people will, will might take that out of context. What's the context here? The context is Paul is speaking to Timothy specifically about leadership and his role as a leader in the church. So the context of the scripture is wrapped up in leadership, being a pastor. That's what it's wrapped up in. It's not wrapped up in in who has the most value in any church. And so therefore men do because they should be in authority and women should be in submission. And so therefore there's more. He's not, that's, the context is not value. The context is not anything but leadership. He's talking about who should be a pastor, who should have authority. And so, amen, we're going to continue this next week. There's going to be a lot. I've got a lot more notes here to, to um, help you understand this even more. But today, this is a hotly debated issue. And I just want to firstly say, and next week again, we'll go into more clarity about Adam and Eve and all the curse and the things that happened there. But firstly, I want to say, ladies, because that scripture is there, it does not mean that somehow men have a higher value than a woman. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about their value. I value my wife very much. She has some good insight that helps me very much sometimes. She says, Reuben, you shouldn't have said that, <laughs> right? She doesn't rebuke me, and, and, but she's very respectful. But she, she will let me know if I said something silly or foolish or something I shouldn't have done. And I will, I've learned. I've learned quite a few bits and pieces from my wife. So this is not saying that women are... Listen, I love women. My mother was a woman, praise God. I love her, right? I love my wife. She's a woman, Okay. Ladies, we love you, ladies. Amen. And uh, every good husband would say amen to that. But uh, this is talking about leadership and authority within the church. And today it is a hotly debated issue. And I understand that there have been, there have, you know, the unfortunate thing is that in our day and age, there's been quite a few pastors that have been found out where they've been sexually immoral or been doing wrong things. And the church has covered that up. And that's wrong that we have covered up any man's sin because he's in authority. And so that's wrong. And it's no wonder that some ladies can struggle with, with male authority because we might try to cover up his sins and all these various... That's foolish, right? But uh, I just wanted to make that statement. Let's open it up for some questions and comments, and then we're going to finish up and start with worship and, and all that. Matt? Um, just how you said, Pastor, about do we look at what culture is doing today? I think I've heard, and you've probably heard the same thing, people dismiss what the Bible says because you've said, oh, let's look at what the Bible says. People says, well, that's not relevant now because that was for the culture then. Mm. The culture is different now. They had slaves then and that was common. We don't have that. And they use that to kind of dismiss those types of scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do you have any anything to say about that, how we can still reference those things even though yes they did live in a different time and they had some things that we don't do now but some of those things we still need to you know reference and say they they still apply now you yeah, know it's a very good question because often that will be the case people will ask right so i understand the premise of the question right so uh, my answer would be that culture changes but king the kingdom doesn't and scripture never is to change and there are particular things. So the um, New Testament scripture doesn't spe specifically talk about uh, you ought to have slaves and you not ought to have slaves necessarily. It speaks about just addressing the issue of having slaves, um, that there would, there would be people in the church that would have slaves and sometimes their slaves would even be in church. And it just addresses the issue of treating everyone fairly, right? So that's a universal truth. It's a universal thing that doesn't change. Uh, you may have, so that would be applied to, you might not have slaves today, but you might have people that are, you're a boss and your employees at work uh, that at work come to your church. And so he's, he's addressing a scripture there, right, where 
he's saying you treat everyone fairly. That's a universal rule. Well, I would say this here is that universal rule that no matter what, if culture changes to a way where even if it was to change so uh, dramatically that all of a sudden all men were now treated as women and all women were treated as men, if we to completely flip the script like that, I would say culture might do that, the world might do that, but the kingdom says this and the scripture never changes. So that's my only real answer to that is that the scripture just doesn't, it doesn't change. Some cultures can change but the scripture doesn't change. And when it comes to this here, he's not talking about, he's not talking about clothing or a particular, uh, you know, having slaves, etc. He's more specifically talking about uh, authority and leadership within the church. And I think that that's a universal rule. I think what you've just said is, is you still need to look at the context of what he's saying about like the slaves yes. thing. What's the context there? He's talking about how you treat people not you are permitted and it's okay and have as many as you want and slaves are good god loves slaves he doesn't you know yes. people were slaves in egypt you know so yes. and he rescued them out of that so there's clearly god's not into making people slaves that's right and yeah. so the, again like that's why i said the context of and i didn't specifically say that but i was explaining when he's talking about that very good yep was there another hand somewhere melanie and then we'll grab our sister here I was just going to ask a question. Mm. So if you went to a church, and there are a lot of churches, probably most of the churches apart from our fellowship and um, that have male leadership, but most of the um, churches don't have male ship, you know, just male preachers, that most of them have females. Now, so if you were a second-generation Christian and you're brought up in a church like that, would you recommend them to leave that church and go to a church where it's just male preachers? Would I recommend it? Depends on who it is. If it was like a family member of mine, I would be wise about it. I wouldn't just be like a bull in a china shop, right? And kind of go, hey, you know that church? Uh, uh, it's wrong. It's Look at scripture, right? I'd be wise about it, even if it was my family member. Um, if it was a family member, say if my brother, and that was the case, then maybe I would perhaps, I would probably give it time especially if they're newly saved, right? I'll give it some time. And um, I'm just mainly talking in general, though, you know, because there's a lot of um, churches, like a lot of yeah. churches all over Australia yeah. who have, you know, been Christians brought up in that, that yeah. type of fellowship. I mean, we're blessed we've got male, le you know, leadership and that's, you know, how we've been discipled. But a lot of churches haven't been discipled like that. Would you recommend that second, that second generation Christian in general to come out? Yeah, look, I'm very cautious before I tell anyone who's in a church that you need to leave that church, right? So I'm cautious about that because I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm very careful about playing the role of the Holy Spirit in God. I'm very careful about that. So I don't want to be, it's not my job to tell everyone what to do. So look, if they opened up, and they wanted to know the question, then I would be straight up with them, right? But I wouldn't go chasing them down to proselytize them and tell them you need to get right. So, so, so I'm just cautious about that. But if they were asking the question or they were curious about it, hey, how come this and that? Then absolutely, no, I, would, I would open up the scriptures to them, and I would show them these scriptures, some of them that I've talked about this morning, and and try to win them to understand this is scripture. Scripture doesn't change. Uh, and so there needs to be, you know, a wisdom around that. But um, yeah, so I'd be I'd be cautious about it. But I wouldn't say no. That flat out, I would just never try to talk to them. So I hope that answers your question. I'll just be wise about it. That's all. I'd ask God help me. And if if it's someone again you really really care about, then I can understand why you may want to try to talk to that person. And so. If it's something, someone you really care about, then again, I would just, I would just ask God for wisdom about how I approach it. That's all. Yeah, very good. Yes. Hi, um, I'm new. I'm Roxanne. Um, hey, Roxanne. Hey, but um, I was just wondering um, if you go to some of the bigger churches where they have a leadership team, um, and you have women in leadership, but they fit more with 
the godly purpose that women were made for. So, you know, nurturing, caring. So those sort of roles within the church and they're leaders of that team. So like the care team or the, out, you know, outreach team, you know, hospital visitations, that sort of thing. But they're doing their role that God created them for of nurturing and caring, but they sort of oversee it in a leadership way. Mm -hmm. um, is that a leadership role that is good? And, but they still are sort of fitting within that idea of submitting to like a wife submits to her husband mm -hmm. in the situation, they are still submitting to the main pastor who then is the yeah. leader in, in that sort of role. And so in a, in a, in an almost business like manner, you submitting to your boss, well, that boss just happens to be the male pastor, but then they fulfill their roles in more of the emotional and nurturing capacity that women yes. have. Yes. So we'll get there next week. Right. But, uh, so there are roles within a church that the Bible actually says for women to, to be able to teach other women and help and, and th do those various things, what you're, what you're mentioning, because <laughs> us guys are not very nurturing, right? And we can be very burr, burr, and harsh like that. And so absolutely, and that's why uh, those, those parts and those roles are vital within a church that need to be in there, because otherwise it's unbalanced, isn't it, right? So absolutely. Um, and I would just say the scripture he says there, right, is he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. So he's being specifically talking about pastoring and shepherding like that, right, and having authority over a man. And so that's what he's talking about there. So where you're saying the various different roles where women can be involved and maybe there's a group of, of, of them and there's one that's leading that, et cetera, or doing a nurturing type of a ministry, then, yeah, that's that's – Again, and I'll get into that next week, but there is scripture that actually talks about um, ladies doing those various roles. So, yeah, very good. Yeah, because I thought that that was really interesting when you were talking about um, uh, Nahab and Jezebel. I yeah. think it was Nahab and Jezebel. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that, you know, he was complaining and he, you know, came home a bit of a sook. And she, and it's like if you take a mom and you take your kids and they're having a bit of a sook or somebody bullied them at school, well, you're going to turn into mommy bear. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't matter whether it's your husband, <laughs> you're going to turn into mommy. Well, what did you do to my kid? You know? Yes. And it's like we have that protective, like, yes. rise up. And, and so I guess for men, when they have that more logical, factual okay we need to do this step and this step and this step yeah but for women we have that protective nature of, i'm going to tear you apart if you if you hurt my baby yeah so it's like you have to be really careful and it's like it's not a fun yeah. role for guys because yeah. you have to like kind of hold it together yeah but at the same time you know but god made need. us god made us perfectly like that that the two balance each other out don't they yeah. right and there's the there's the male who can tend to be maybe more logical and analytical and the Wife can be more along the emotion side, but they balance each other out perfectly. That's how God created it. And that's true within the church as well. Very good. Very good. All right. We're going to have to finish up because we're going to let the guys get ready for worship. Amen. Very good. Hallelujah. We'll continue our Bible hour next week. And uh, God bless you. We'll start service soon.